All righty, here we go. What All page right. is it on? Uh, we're starting on page 179. So we're going to read Los Aguacates. Um, very quickly before we get started, Mrs. Kelsey read Las Papas, and that was kind of a crazy chapter. Um, so right now we know that Mama is now in the hospital. Um, her sickness and the valley fever got much worse. Um, so she has to go there. Um, we know that Esperanza is now working, which is something totally different and something that she's not used to at all. Um, so that was kind of crazy. Um, we also know, so the potatoes connection um, with Esperanza working, she is now working in the sheds and cutting out the potato eyes like Mrs. Kelsey had talked about in her video. Um, so they take the potato eyes and go ahead and replant them and that's how they get their potatoes for the next season. So I thought that was super cool. Um, we also went through, so we read through in that last chapter, um, Christmas happened. So that was kind of sad for Esperanza because mama was in the hospital and she wasn't really um, kind of responding to her and wasn't really talking to her. So she kind of spent Christmas alone besides um, with Hortensia and all of them who are taking really good care of her at this point. Um, that chapter ended with her telling mama that she was going to take care of the family and that mama didn't have to worry. So that's where we ended off. And we are going to start today with Los Aguacates or Avocados chapter on page 179. Here we go. Esperanza's breath made smoky vapors in front of her face as she waited for the truck to take her to tie grapevines. So the smoky vapors they're talking about um, are the like on the really cold days. If you guys are ever waiting for the bus and you're breathing, you can see your breath. That's what she's talking about. She shifted from foot to foot and clapped her gloved hands together and wondered what was so new about the new year. It already seemed old with the same routines. She worked during the week. She helped Hortensia cook dinner in the late afternoons. In the evening, she helped Josefina with the babies and Isabel with her homework. She went to see Mama on Saturdays and Sundays. She huddled in the field near a smudge pot to keep warm and mentally counted the money she would need to bring Abuelita here. Every other week, with the small amounts she saved, she bought a money order from the market and put it in her valise. So um, with the money that she saved, she was able to go to the store. She was able to purchase a money order. So it's kind of like a check. And she would keep those checks and she put, would put them in her suitcase so that she had the money that she needed to bring Abuelita to here. She figured that if she kept working until Peaches, she would have enough for Abuelita's travel. Her problem then would be how to reach Abuelita. And we remember um, the, that Tio Luis was watching the convent where Abuelita was staying and was also um, watching probably the post office to see if any letters were coming or going so that he could figure out where they went. Um, so that was one of the things. Yes, Aaliyah, what's your question? Sorry, I didn't mean to hit it. Oh, that's okay. We're all getting new to this. All right, 180. The men went down the first rows, pruning the thick grapevines and leaving a few long branches or canes on each tr trunk. She followed along with others and tied the canes on the tout wire that was stretched post to post. She ached from the cold and had to keep moving all day long to stay warm. That night, as she soaked her hands in warm water, she realized that she no longer recognized them as her own. Cut and scarred, swollen and stiff, they looked like the hands of a very old man. Flint, did you have a question, buddy? My question was where we were, but I uh, you said 180, so I know where we are now. Yep, we're right in we're right in the middle, um, right where Esperanza is starting to say, "Are you sure this will work?" On 180. Okay. All right. Are you sure this will work? Asked Esperanza as she watched Hortensia cut a ripe avocado in half. Of course, said Hortensia, removing the big pit and leaving a hole in the heart of the fruit. She scooped out the pulp, mashed it on a plate, and added some glycerin. You have seen me make this for your mother many times. We are lucky to have the avocados this time of year. Some friends of Josefina brought them from Los Angeles. So this is where um, the title of the chapter comes in. She is looking at her hands, and they're super cut and scarred and swollen and stiff from all the work she's been doing. So um, Hortensia is making her 
kind of an avocado mash that she can put on her hands um, and her hands will soak up the oil and hopefully get softer for her. Hortensia rubbed the avocado mixture into Esperanza's hands. You must keep it on for 20 minutes so your hands will soak up the oils. Esperanza looked at her hands covered in the greasy green lotion and remembered when mama used to sit like this after a long day of gardening or after horseback rides with papa through the dry mesquite grasslands. When she was a little girl, she had laughed at mama's hands covered in what looked like guacamole. So guacamole or guacamole, however you want to pronounce it, is an avocado-based dip that developed in Mexico. And some of you guys have probably had that before. But she had loved for her to rinse them because afterward, Esperanza would take mama's hands and put the palms on her own face so that she could feel their suppleness and breathe in the fresh smell. Esperanza was surprised at the simple things she missed about mama. She missed her way of walking into a room graceful and regal or impressive and beautiful. She missed watch, watching her hands crocheting, her fingers moving nimbly, and most of all, she longed for the sound of Mama's strong and assured laughter. She put her hands under the faucet, rinsed off the avocado, and patted them dry. They felt better, but still looked red and weathered. She took another avocado, cut it in half, swung the knife into the pit, and pulled it from the flesh. She repeated Hortensia's recipe as she sat for the second time with her hands smothered. She realized that it wouldn't matter how much avocado and glycerin she put on them. They would never look like the hands of a wealthy woman from El Rancho de las Rosas because they were the hands of a poor campesina. And remember, campesina meant field worker. I also love that you guys are being super chatty in the chat right now. But if we could wait for that just until the end so we're not distracting everybody from being able to read the book, I would appreciate that too, okay? All right, we're in the middle of 182. It was at the end of the great time when the doctor stopped Esperanza and Miguel in the hallway of the hospital before they could reach Mama's room. I asked the nurses to alert me when they saw you coming. I'm sorry to tell you that your mother has pneumonia. How can that be, said Esperanza? her hands beginning to shake as she stared at the doctor. I thought she was getting better. This disease, valley fever, makes the body tired and susceptible to other infections. We are treating her with medications. She is weak. I know this is hard for you, but we'd like to ask that she have no visitors for at least a month, maybe longer. We can't take a chance that she will contract another infection from any outside germs that might be brought into the hospital. So the doctor's just asking Esperanza now um, that she not come back to visit for a while because she could possibly, um, they could possibly bring in germs from outside the hospital and could make mama more sick. Um, so as you can imagine, being asked to not see um, somebody that you love a, a lot for a long time has got to be super duper hard. Yes, Valeria. This, remind, this reminds me of the virus, like we've got to stay home and like to not like share our germs. Yeah, no, exactly. That's a good connection. That's a really good connection. We've had to not be around people that we love and want to see because of that too. So that's a really good connection. Nice job, Valeria. All right, middle of page 183. Can I see her just for a few moments? The doctor hesitated, then nodded and walked away. Esperanza hurried to Mama's bed and Miguel followed. Esperanza couldn't imagine not seeing her for so many weeks. Mama, said Esperanza. Mama slowly opened her eyes and gave Esperanza the smallest smile. She was thin and frail. Her hair was strewn and bedraggled, and her face was so white that it seemed to fade into the sheets, as if she would sink into the bed and disappear forever. Mama looked like a ghost of herself. The doctor said I can't come to visit for a while. Mama nodded, her eyelids slowly falling back down as if it had been a burden to keep them up, which means she was struggling to kind of stay awake. Esperanza felt Miguel's hand on her shoulder. Anza, we should go, he said. But Esperanza would not move. She wanted to do something for Mama to help make her better. 
She noticed the brush and hairpins on the bedside table. She carefully rolled Mama on her side and gathered all of her hair together. She brushed it and plaited it into a big long braid. And she plaited it into a long braid. Wrapping it around Mama's head, she gently pinned it into place. Then she helped Mama lie on her back. Her hair now framing her face against the white linens like a braided halo. Like she used to wear it in Aguas Calientes. Esperanza bent down close to Mama's ear. Don't worry, Mama. Remember, I will take care of everything. I am working and I can pay the bills. I love you. Mama said softly, I love you too. And as Esperanza turned to leave, she heard Mama whisper, no matter what happens. Ooh. You need to get away from the camp, Esperanza, said Hortensia, as she handed her grocery as she handed her the grocery list and asked her to go to the market with Miguel. It is the first of spring and it's beautiful outside. So now we've made it through winter and they're kind of going through into the first um, season of spring. I thought you and Josefina always looked, always looked forward to marketing on Saturday, said Esperanza. We do, but today we are helping Melina and Irene make enchiladas. Could you go for us? Esperanza knew they were trying to keep her occupied. Mama had been in the hospital for three months and Esperanza hadn't been allowed to visit for several weeks. Since then, Esperanza hadn't been acting like herself. She went through the motions of living. She was polite enough answering everyone's questions with the simplest answers, but she was tormented by Mama's absence. That means she was really bothered by Mama's absence. Papa Abuelita, Mama, who would be next? She crawled into bed as early as possible each night, curled her body into a tight ball and didn't move until morning. Top of page 186. She knew Josefina and Hortensia were worried about her. She nodded to Hortensia, took the list and went to find Miguel. Be sure you tell Miguel to go to Mr. Yakota's market, Hortensia called after her. Hortensia had been right about the weather. The fog and grayness had gone. The valley air was crisp and clean from recent rains. They drove along fields of tall, feathery asparagus plants that she would soon be packing. Citrus groves displayed their leftover fruit like decorations on Christmas trees. And even though it was still cool, there was an expectancy that Esperanza could smell, a rich, loamy odor that promised spring. Miguel, why must we always drive so far to shop at the Japanese market when there are other stores closer to Arvin? Some of the other market owners aren't as kind to Mexicans as Mr. Yakota, said Miguel. He stocks many of the things we need and he treats us like people. What do you mean? Esperanza, people here think that all Mexicans are alike. They think that we are all uneducated, dirty, poor, and unskilled. It does not occur to them that many have been trained in professions in Mexico. That means that many of them um, have been trained to do any kind of job in Mexico. They don't realize that. Esperanza looked down at her clothes. She wore a shirtwaist dress that used to be Mama's and before that someone else's. Over the dress was a man's sweater with several buttons missing, which was also too big. She leaned up and looked in the mirror. Her face was tanned from the weeks in the fields, and she had taken to wearing her hair in a long braid like Hortensia because Mama had been right. It was more practical that way. Miguel, how could anyone look at me and think I was uneducated? He smiled at her joke. The fact remains, Esperanza, that you, for instance, have a better education than most people's children in this country. But no one is likely to recognize that or take the time to learn it. Americans see us as one big brown group who are good only for manual labor, which means that they're only good for working in the fields or doing some kind of hard work. At this market, no one stares at us or treats us like outsiders or calls us dirty greasers. My father says that Mr. Yakota is a very smart businessman. He is getting rich on other people's bad manners. 
So a lot of the other um, markets and sellers that they go to um, are not as nice to the Mexican people as Mr. Yokota is. So he's saying that because Mr. Yokota is so nice to them, um, the Mexicans choose to go there and give him his business instead of where they would be treated badly, which would make sense. Miguel's explanation was familiar. Esperanza's contact with Americans outside the camp had been limited to the doctor and the nurses at the hospital, but she had heard stories from others about how they were treated. There were special sections at the movie theater for Negroes and Mexicans. In town, people did not want their children going to the same schools with Mexicans. Living away from town in the company camp had its advantages, she decided. The children all went to school together, white, Mexican, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino. It didn't seem to matter to anyone because they were all poor. Sometimes she felt as if she lived in a cocoon, protected from much of the indignation. And indignation um, is kind of, is the feeling like you're angry or annoyed um, at the unfair treatment. So she was able to stay away from that because she stayed in the camp and stayed away from most of the Americans. Miguel pulled the truck into the parking lot at the market. I'll meet you. I'm going to talk about railroad jobs with those men gathered on the corner. Esperanza went inside. Mr. Yokota was from Tokyo, and the store had all sorts of Japanese cooking ingredients, like seaweed and ginger, and a fresh fish counter with fish that still had their heads. But there were Mexican products, too like masa de harina for tamales, and masa de harina is like a dried corn dough um, that they make tamales with, chiles for salsa, and big bags of dried beans for frijoles, and that's like a bean dish from Mexico. There was even cow intestines in the meat case for menudo, or it, that's a type of Mexican soup that's made out of the cow's intestine. Um, kind of sounds weird, but I bet it's good. Valeria, have you ever had that before? Menudo? You have? That's awesome. And other specialties like chorizo, which is a spicy pork sausage, and pig's feet. Esperanza's favorite part of the store was the ceiling that was crowded with peculiar combination of Japanese paper lanterns and pinatas shaped like stars and donkeys. There was a small tissue donkey that Esperanza had not noticed before. It was like the one that Mama had bought her a few years ago. Esperanza had thought it was so cute that she refused to break it, even though it had been filled with sweets. Instead, she had hung it in her room above her head. So she's reminiscing now back to a few years ago when Mama had bought her a pinata, um, a small tissue donkey pinata, and she didn't want to break it because she thought it was adorable. A clerk walked by and impulsively, that means without thinking, she pointed to the miniature pinata. Por favor, she said, please. She bought the other things she needed, including another money order. That one, that was one more benefit, sorry guys, of Mr. Yakota's market. She could buy money orders there. So that was another reason she liked to go there is because she could put all of her money together into a money order and get it there and then take it back to the camp to put in her valise. She was waiting in the truck when Miguel came back. Another money order? What do you do with them all? Asked Miguel. I save them in my valise. They are for such small amounts, but together they'll be enough to someday bring Abuelita here. So remember, they've been talking about that. That's kind of their main goal is to get Abuelita here, especially now because Mama's sick. And the pinata? It's not anyone's birthday. I bought it for Mama. I'm going to ask the nurses to put it near her bed so she'll know that I'm thinking of her. We can stop by the hospital on the way back. Will you cut a hole in the top for me so I can put the caramels inside? The nurses can eat them. He took out his pocket knife and made an opening in the pinata. While Miguel drove, Esperanza began feeding in the caramels. Not far down the main road, they approached an almond grove. The trees flushed with gray green leaves and white blossoms. Esperanza noticed a girl and a woman walking hand in hand, each with a grocery bag in her other arm. 
She couldn't help but think what a nice scene it made with the two men framed against so many spring blossoms. Esperanza recognized one of them. I think that is Marta. Miguel stopped the truck, then slowly backed up. We should give her a ride. Esperanza reluctantly nodded, remembering the last time they'd given her a lift, but she opened the door. Esperanza and Miguel, que buena suerte. What good luck, said Marta. This is my mother, Ada. Thanks for the ride. Marta's mother had the same short curly black hair, but hers was sprinkled with gray. Miguel got out and put all the groceries in the truck bed so they could sit in the front. Ada said, I heard about your mother and I've been praying for her. Esperanza was surprised and touched. Thank you, I'm grateful. Are you coming to our camp, asked Miguel. No, said Marta. As you probably know, I'm not welcome there. So now we know that Marta is not welcome in um, Esperanza and Miguel's camp. As you probably know, I'm not welcome there. We're going a mile or so up the road to the Strikers farm. We were tossed out of the migrant workers camp and were told either to go back to work or leave. So we left. We aren't going to work under those disgusting conditions and for those pitiful wages. Ada was quiet and nodded when Marta talked about the strike. Esperanza tw felt a twinge of envy when she noticed that Marta never let go of her mother's hand. That means that Esperanza was kind of, um, she was wishing that she was able to do the same thing, that she would be able to ride in the car holding her mom's hand. There are hundreds of us together at this farm, but thousands around the, co the county and more people join our cause each day. You are new here, but in time, you'll understand what we're trying to change. Turn left, she said, pointing to a dirt road rutted with tire marks. Miguel turned down the path bordered in cotton fields. Finally, they reached several acres of land surrounded by chain link fencing and barbed wire. It's single opening guarded by several men wearing armbands. Aki, right here, said Ada. What are the guards for, asked Esperanza. They're for protection, said Marta. The farmer who owns the land is sympathetic to us. That means he feels for them. But a lot of people don't like the strikers causing trouble. We've had threats. The men take turns at the entrance. Miguel pulled the truck to the side of the road and stopped. All right, guys, again, I'm going to remind you to make sure that you're not commenting during this, okay, because it's distracting. It's distracting to me as I'm reading and seeing it pop up because I think there's questions and it's got to be distracting to the others too, okay? We're in the middle of page 193. There were only 10 wooden toilet stalls for hundreds of people and Esperanza could smell the effects from the truck. Some people lived in tents but others had only burlap bags stretched between poles. Some were living in their cars or old trucks. Mattresses were on the ground where people and dogs rested. A goat was tied to a tree. There was a long pipe that lay on top of the ground and a line of water spigots sticking up from it. So that means that um, they had a long line of like pipe that was coming out with water spigots and that's where each person in that camp had to get their water. Near each spigot were pots and pans and campfire rings, the makings of outdoor kitchens. In an irrigation ditch, women were washing clothes and children were bathing at the same time. Clotheslines ran everywhere. It was a great jumble of humanity and confusion. So based on that paragraph I just read, I'm guessing um, that you guys came to the same conclusion. I would say that Esperanza's camp, even though where they live is not um, the ranch that they were at in Mexico or um, the it's, but theirs is much better than what um, Marta's family is in now. And they had to leave because um, they were on strike and the people didn't want them there anymore. All right. Top of page 194. Esperanza could not stop looking. She felt hypnotized by the squalor or the extreme dirtiness and unpleasantness, but Marta and her mother didn't seem the least bit embarrassed. Home sweet home, said Marta. They all climbed out of the truck. 
But before Marta and Ada could retrieve their groceries, a campesino family coming from the opposite direction approached them. So that means a um, field worker family was coming towards them. The children were dirty and skinny and the mother held an infant who was crying. Do you have food so that I can feed my family? Said the father. We were thrown out of our camp because I was striking. My family has not eaten in two days. There are too many people coming into the valley each day who will work for pennies. Yesterday I worked all day and made less than 50 cents and I cannot buy food for one day with that. I was hoping that here with others who have been through the same, you are welcome here, said Ada. Esperanza reached into the truck bed and opened the large bag of beans. Hand me your hat, senor. The man handed over his large sun hat and she filled it with dry beans, then gave it back to him. So that got me thinking, remembering to um, a little while ago, a couple chapters ago, when we read about Esperanza coming on the train and her, um, she opened her valise and the doll was out and she saw the, um, the girl that she described, the little girl she described as dirty come over and want to touch it. She wanted nothing to do with that. She remembered, um, if you can remember, mama was pretty disappointed in her. And now this family's coming over to her saying that they haven't eaten and she just opened up her own groceries um, and handed him some stuff so that they had something to eat. So that's a pretty big change for Esperanza there. Gracias, gracias, he said. Esperanza looked at the two older children, their eyes watery and vacant. She lifted the pinata and held it out to them. They said nothing, but hurried toward her, took it, and ran back to their family. So that was another big thing for her. She just bought the pinata for Mama to put on the bedstand there to, so that Mama knew she was thinking about her. But she saw how desperate um, and how upset that this family was because they didn't have any money or any food. And she just gave the pinata that she bought to them. So that was really sweet. So we're seeing a pretty big change in Esperanza right now. Marta looked at her. Are you sure you aren't already on our side? Esperanza shook her head. They were hungry, that's all. Even if I believed in what you are doing, I must take care of my mother. Ada put her hand on Esperanza's arm and smiled. We all do what we have to do. Your mother would be proud of you. Miguel handed them their bags and they walked toward the farmer's field. Before they reached the gate, Marta suddenly turned and said, I shouldn't be telling you this, but the strikers are more organized than they appear. In a few weeks, during asparagus, things are going to happen all over the country. We are going to shut down everything, the fields, the sheds, the railroad. If you have not joined us by then, be very careful. Then she hurried to catch up with her mother. So Marta just basically told them that anybody who is working um, in the next few weeks is going to be in some kind of danger. Um, she said the strikers are going to try to shut down everything. They're going to try to go into the fields, into the sheds where Hortensia, Josefina, and um, Esperanza are working, and even to the railroad. Um, and she said their, their safety could be, could be not so great. All right, um, top of page 196, that second paragraph there. As Miguel and Esperanza rode back to Arvin, neither of them said a word for many miles. Marta's threat and the guilt of having a job weighed heavily on Esperanza's mind. Do you think they are right, she asked. I don't know, said Miguel. What the man said is true. I have heard that there will be 10 times the people here looking for jobs in the next few months from Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, and other places too, and that they are poor people like us who need to feed their families. If so many people, if so many come and are willing to work for pennies, what will happen to us? But until then, with so many joining the strikes, I might be able to get a job at the railroad. So they're saying right now that their wages are a little bit more um, than pennies, but there are people that are willing to come and work for like a penny an hour. Can you imagine doing a hard hard hours work for a penny? Um, so they're saying that people are, are coming to this side of, or to where they are, to the camps, and will work for that. So that means that they're obviously going to want to pay the people who only want a penny an hour versus 20 cents an hour. That's saving them a lot of money. 
Um, so he's worried about it. But he said with so many people striking, he may be able to find a job on the railroad. So let's see what happens. Esperanza's mind wrestled with Miguel's words. For him, the strike was an opportunity to work at the job he loved and to make it in this country. But for her, it was a threat to her finances, which means it was a threat to her money. Abuelita's arrival and Mama's recuperation. Then there was the matter of her own safety. She thought of Mama and Abuelita, and she knew there was only one thing for her to do. Esperanza studied her hands a few nights later as she walked toward the cabin and hoped Hortensia had a few more avocados. It was later than usual. She had been weeding asparagus in a far field, so she had been on so she had been on the last truck. When she arrived at the cabin, everyone was crowded around the small table. There were fresh tortillas on a plate, and Hortensia was stirring a pan of machacha, or scrambled eggs with shredded meat, onions, and peppers. It was Miguel's favorite, but they usually ate it for breakfast. What is the occasion? asked Esperanza. I got a job in the machine shop at the railroad. Oh, Miguel, that's good news. So many railroad workers have joined the strikers. I know it might be temporary, but if I do a good job, maybe they will keep me. That is right, said Alfonso. You do good work. They will see it. They will keep you. Esperanza sat down and listened to Miguel tell the others about the job, but she wasn't hearing his words. She was seeing his eyes dancing like Papa's when he used to talk about the land. She watched Miguel's animated face, thinking that at last his dream was coming true. <sighs> crazy chapter for lots of crazy more information. I'm excited to keep reading. Um, and see, the next one's called asparagus again, so we'll have to see what happens um, with that too. Um, like I said, we talked about this a little bit, but you can really, really start to see a change in Esperanza now. Just the fact that she bought that um, pinata and gave it to that family that really needed it, um, that shows a big change in her already. So that was that was really nice of her and really super cool. What? Um, what you have a question, buddy? Me? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I again, I hope you guys are loving, loving, loving this book. Um, we're getting to the really good parts now. We have some really good chapters and stuff coming up. Um, so I'm really excited to keep reading this. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for joining in with me live. Um, again, this is going to be recorded, so your friends will get to see some of you um, that weren't that weren't on this video chat right now. Um, but I hope that you all continue to stay super safe. Um, make sure you're getting sleep. I hope now, I know you've had a lot of office hours today and things like that. I hope you're able to get outside and do something fun before this rain comes too. So, all right, guys. Thanks for stopping in. We'll see you later. Have a good rest of the day. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.